gracious Heavenly Father, we just come into your presence this New Year's Day, just giving you all the, the glory, all the thanks, all the praise for all that you are in, in our lives. We long to grow in grace and knowledge of you. I just ask that you would filter out that which is foolish, but seal to our hearts that which is truth. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com, and today is New Year's Day. We've entered 2023. I hope you all have a happy New Year, a very blessed New Year. As we move forward every, every day closer to our Lord's return. In our Sunday services, we're studying together 2 Corinthians verse by verse. And in our last study together, we were in verse 8 of chapter 1, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8. When we began the chapter, we were shown seven reasons that are given for suffering. How that God employs suffering to teach us and to direct our trust and our faith in Him. Uh, verses verse 8 and 9 for we would not brethren have you ignorant of our trouble which came to us in Asia that we were pressed out of measure above strength insomuch that we despaired even of life but we had the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves but in God which raiseth the dead and if you look at the sentence of death as physical death the verse makes no sense we know that we have uh, died with Christ, been crucified with Christ, that we've been uh, taken down into death, His death, buried with Him, raised with Him to walk in newness of life, that death to self, to sin, self, the law, the world, all for one purpose, and that is that our confidence may, our trust may be in Him and not ourselves. In the 11th verse, we, we see that the Holy Spirit, through Paul, asks for the prayer of many of the saints uh, in his behalf. What the Holy Spirit is saying here, I believe, is that if they unite with prayer, in the case of Paul, uh, it's so that there might be that many more giving thanks on behalf of Paul. In the 12th verse, we see that one of the great results of prayer and one of the great results of suffering is rejoicing. The, the grammar uh, says the act of our rejoicing is the act of our boasting. So is it then proper for a Christian to, uh, to boast or to rejoice? If you prefer that translation, of course it is. Look at the testimony of his conscience that in simplicity, simplicity, uh, that word there is from our Greek word hagios, the word uh, uh, sanctified, uh, holy. Uh, the, the word is holiness, then in holiness and, and pure-mindedness or godly sincerity. That is, in other words, uh, it's the word, the, the, the word phrase there in the Greek carries with it the connotation of, of a proper motive. A proper motive. Not with fleshly wisdom but in the grace of God we've behaved ourselves we've conducted ourselves in the world that is the world religious system uh, any any world religious system based on human merit the that which for the most part the the world is dominated by that some system of merit uh, 
and more abundantly, it says, toward you. Folks, is that the testimony of our conscience as we enter this new year? The testimony of our conscience that in the area of holiness and in the area of purity, not in the area of fleshly wisdom, but in the area of the grace of God, we have behaved ourselves in, in the area or the sphere of, says the grammar, of the world and more abundantly with you. Now, if we if we see what the verse is saying there, it's it's the area, the sphere of our activity. This is where we live and breathe and walk and talk. It's our it's our day to day conduct. Surely the Holy Spirit reveals here that Paul has a sanctified conscience. So do you. You have a conscience that's part of the old nature, but you also have a, a sanctified conscience that, that's a conscience which is part of the new nature, and its knowledge stems from this book. It stems from the Word of God. It's, it's a conscience that comes from the revelation of the Word of God. Now, he's not only saying that that's the testimony of his conscience, but he ends the verse more abundantly toward you as a result of their request, as a result of their prayer, as a result of their fellowship uh, with him in his situation and in the need uh, of their fellowship then the boasting or the rejoicing is together with them. It isn't that Paul wouldn't have experienced the rejoicing, but many of them wouldn't have. And so one of the major results of the request for prayer here is that they might rejoice together with him and that he might rejoice together with them. He didn't say the testimony of my conscience, but our conscience is what he said. I think he means himself. If you took it strictly in context, himself, those who labored with him, those who labored with him in prayer, you know, uh, Timothy, Silas, you know, if you limited that to the context. And that seems to be the most likely direct interpretation. Of course, there's a, there's a wide application here, you know, as far as the rest of the body of Christ is concerned. Uh, probably the most uh, significant aspect of prayer is not that you get your way by supplicating. The word supplication, there's different words for prayer. Supplication is one of them. It literally means begging. You're begging God for something. I couldn't think of anything more to beg God for than for us to realize we're, who we are in Christ and where we stand in His program the church as it relates to the, to the as it pertains to the grace of God it's it's what we all desire or should desire of one another so one of the aspects of that supplication is that we be directed by the new nature not the old and that we would come to him in holiness holiness now that's not what many Christians might think well, I can't come to Him unless I'm holy. Or I act holy or, or whatever. It's, you know, that, that we recognize God as God Almighty. He's the eternal God. He's the creator of heaven and earth. He hung the stars in the sky. He, he knows our, our path. And, and when he, He's directed our steps, He's done a lot of things. But this, this sovereign God that we so love to proclaim here on this channel is he's God and he has said that we are holy righteous holy unblameable unreprovable in his sight and that's how we are to present ourselves to him and uh, that is our reasonable service is that we do that 
people. You want to talk about Christian responsibility. I prefer to use the word obligation. That is our obligation. We are obligated to walk worthy of the calling wherewith we were called. So uh, we come to him in holiness. So that's recognizing that he is God. Uh, he is sovereign. He's that he's infinitely holy and righteous, that he's a jealous God. He's a God who demands holiness, which is ours, dearly beloved, through our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, one great, one, one great aspect, one of the great, I think, aspects of supplication is that it directs us into the area of the new nature. And pure-mindedness uh, simplicity, you know, we preach nothing but Christ and Him cru crucified. It's the simplicity of Christ. It seems complex. It's really not all that complex. There is a simplicity to grace. There is a simplicity uh, to our walk. Uh, it's not an easy one, but uh, pure-mindedness. And... Uh, our prayer should always be that, that God directs us in, in accordance with His Word, not according to our feelings, our emotions, our human logic. Uh, I believe that the your I believe your ability to understand the full benefits of supplication in worship is severely limited if you're limited in the knowledge of this book. I think pure-mindedness or, or godly sincerity is something that grows as we increase in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, as we grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ is the Word of God. Can man, by searching... Uh, keep in mind that Romans st strictly declares that no man seeks after God. But, uh, my question would be, you know, can man by searching find out God? And the answer has to be no. Uh, you wouldn't know that by listening to much of modern preaching today. But no man seeks after God. He's found by revelation, and you know what you know of Christ, not because of certain experiences that you've had, not because of how your parents raised you, not because of what the preacher taught you, not because of, of what you just naturally assume must be true or anything of that nature, uh, but because of the revelation of the Word of God. God says He's delivered us from the power of darkness and He's translated us into the kingdom of His dear Son. That's what the book says. That's what God says of you and me. Uh, well, how do you know that, Steve? Uh, well, oh, I just feel it. I have this transcendent feeling I know that I'm translated into the kingdom of his beloved son I just I just because I feel it now no, just wait a minute just or wait a while you'll lose it if, if you don't have the headache now you'll get it you don't have you don't have the pains now they'll come if, if you think that you're experiencing heaven now just wait something will change Folks, the only way that you know it is because God said so, and I think that's marvelous. I think that's wonderful. I know that I'm delivered from the power of darkness. Why? Because He said so. I know that there was, a, a, there was an ark because why well, I found an old rotten piece of wood on top of a mountain. No, no. Because God said there was. And, you know, and I may not always live like I should. I may not look like, always like, look like a, a Christian, you know, should, or walk like it, or talk like it, or, or whatever. Uh, but I know that that's true. 
I know that he's translated me from the kingdom of darkness, from the, this ugly, nasty, scary world of, and I'm not talking about as much about as much about the filth that's in the world, but that the world in the sense of a, of a religious system that's based on human merit, where that you have to, you feel that you have to earn your way to heaven or you have to earn favor from God. God will only bless you if you're walking and talking and acting in the right way. He's already blessed you with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies in Christ Jesus. This, you, you begin on the basis of so much extreme positive reinforcement, folks, that you don't have any, you don't have any reason at all to even entertain that word merit. You can't place merit and grace beside one another, and, and you can't marry the two. They're incompatible. Oh, you know, I, God, I praise God that someday, just someday, I, 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 just, I just hope I'll be translated into the kingdom of His dear Son. No, no. I am now translated into the kingdom of His beloved Son. How do I know that? Because He said so. And when I come to him in prayer, my mind is directed to what he said in this book. Anytime I go to prayer. You know, he said, don't you remember that I told you these things? You know, and that's what, that's what happens when... I come in, in supplication, not in the area of carnal or fleshly or worldly wisdom. You know, that's what I'd be tempted to do separate from the knowledge of the Word of God if I didn't have this book, but I have this book. And I thank God for that every day. There may come a day where I don't. And I find that God's ways are not my ways, that God's ways are not man's way. And folks, the principal aspect, the principal characteristic of worldly wisdom is merit. If you went back on this channel and you looked at the very first video I did in Ephesians chapter 1, You know where this, this ministry has stood when it comes to the world religious system based on human merit. The, that system that would put you to death thinking it's doing God's service. And it, it is absolutely intrinsic to every religious philosophy that, that merit, that, that idea of human merit, every religion except Christianity. And yet it's crept into Christianity. It crept in a long time ago. And once you, we realize that, once one can see how much paganism has crept into Christianity, <coughs> look, folks, why did God shower grace on Noah? Uh, he's so, had to be such a terrific guy. Yeah, he's a little bit, a little, little bit better, just a little bit better than all the rest of, you know, of humanity. Why did he call Abraham? Why did God call Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees? Why did he do that? Well, well, he looked down, and Abraham was the only guy worth calling. And, all, and then all, and all you've done, folks, is you, you have have in, inserted paganism into Christianity. You've said that there was merit in Abraham that caused God to operate, and it was, you know, there was merit in Noah. And so now, all of a sudden, grace is no longer grace. How do you want to continue on and go through the new year? I ask you from the heart. How do you want to live? Given what Christ has done for you, how should you then live? 
How should we live? Uh, Noah found grace in the eyes of, of God, not on the basis of merit, but because God, separate from merit, showered grace upon Abraham, and He showered grace upon you, and He showered grace upon me. Was Abraham good? Well, no. In fact, Romans 4 tells me he was ungodly. He was God's enemy. He, he wasn't seeking God. He wasn't serving God. Where is any merit there? God called him. Dearly beloved, the principal characteristic of carnal, fleshly, worldly wisdom is merit. It's the it seems to be the stumbling block of every Christian, just almost every Christian you meet. And I believe, you know, in our context, the, the principal characteristic of fleshly wisdom is merit. And I believe worship, which we see here, and, and supplication before the Lord, it has to be separate from merit. And God's people find it very difficult to separate themselves from merit. If there is to be true rejoicing as a result of worship and prayer and supplication and prayer, it must be separate from carnal logic, which is basically merit. That's the world system, which you're not a part of. In fact, you've been called out of that system into a relationship with the God of all grace. In all honesty, the Christian church does not set the norm for Christian living. I've heard pastors say, Steve, you know, the, the Christian church sets the norm for Christian... God, I hope that's not true. I, I, would, I would like to think that it was. it's this book, folks. I mean, if it because if it does, what a terrible thought. I mean, I, you know, I recognize styles and customs change, you know, but folks, Christ does not. Not in the area or the sphere of worldly wisdom or fleshly wisdom, but in the area of the grace of God. Listen, dearly beloved, the overriding characteristic of the grace of God is that it is separate from merit. The minute that you put merit in it, you don't understand grace. When we were alienated from God and enemies in our mind by wicked works, yet now hath He reconciled in the body of His flesh through death to present you holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in His sight. For when we were enemies of God and hostile toward Him. We were told this in Romans chapter 4. That's when, that's when God showered grace upon you. Not when you did something. Whatever you did followed that. It didn't precede it. And that's what Christians have a hard time grabbing hold of. You know, I don't come to God in any sense in, in, in supplication based upon merit, but in the area and the sphere of the grace of God. And it's a marvelous thing to walk in the grace of God. I, we read in Ephesians 4, He's forgiven us all our trespasses. We read in Colossians 2, He's forgiven us all sin. And I have somebody tell me that if I do certain things, then, then God will forgive my sin. And, and, I, and I say, well, I must not know how to read. You know, because both in the Greek and in the English, I read He's already forgiven all my sin. That's grace. And folks, you couldn't sin up that grace. You couldn't sin out the up the out sin out the forgiveness. You can't do it. So how do you want to live? 
in the year 2023. We know God made peace through, through the blood of His cross. You who were sometimes alienated, enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath He reconciled in the body of His flesh through death to present you holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in His sight. Oh, but Steve, that's if you continue in the faith grounded in, in not be moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard, which, you know, in a hundred thousand pulpits, and I think I'm being conservative here, you know, preach, well, if you don't continue in the faith, then you're not reconciled. When it's a first-class condition in the Greek, a first-class condition is quite simply, I guess the best way I could explain it would be it's, uh, it's an active verb that's followed by a... Uh, another active verb in, that's in the indicative mood. It's of certainty, okay? Uh, sin, it, it says, it's saying, since you continue in the faith and you will. That's what it's saying. Uh, you know, am I now reconciled or not? Oh, yeah, Steve, you're, you're now reconciled if you continue in the faith. Folks, the present reality is not dependent upon a future contingency. It's a first-class condition in the grammar. It's saying, Steve, if you continue in the faith, it's because you're now reconciled. And that's God's grace. And what does fleshly wisdom say? What's carnal, worldly, fleshly wisdom say? What does it say? Well, well if you continue in the, faith, faith, in the faith, you'll be reconciled. That's... that's that's fleshly wisdom. That's carnal logic. That's apart from this book. Reasoning apart from Scripture. The truth is that my continuance de depends upon my reconciliation, not the other way around. And that's grace, and that's what the passage says. The text says that this is our conversation. This is how we behave ourselves in the world. It, this is how we conduct ourselves in the world. It's interesting because, you know, to, to even think about that, because I don't, we don't conduct ourselves toward one another one way and then toward the world another way. Uh, and more abundantly with you. Remember, Christ prayed not that we be taken out of the world, but that we be preserved in it. You know, it's not, well, if my people are not faithful, they ought to wind up in hell. That, that's not, that was not His prayer. You know, kind of like, you know, out of the million, million and a half so people that God led out of the land of Egypt, only two get to heaven, Caleb and Joshua. Oh my gosh, there were, I have actually heard pastors who actually have, have stated such nonsense as that. What a ridiculous conclusion, you know, to come to. In the, I think you got a real problem, folks, in your Bible studies if you make Palestine heaven. You know, you can't make the promised land heaven. That's it's fellowship and communion. That's the that's the, the subject here. You know, sure you can lose your fellowship, you can lose your communion, but you can't lose the grace of God. The Holy Spirit speaking through Paul said, as we studied First Corinthians, now I, I counsel you that, that you not have fellowship with certain people who are conducting themselves in a certain way. But I didn't say to go out of the world. You know, to ignore it completely because if that's the case, then you'd, well, you'd never touch such a thing. You'd just be out of the world system. You can't do that. You know, your sphere of activity, folks, my sphere of activity 
is in the grace of God. And it's conducted in the sphere of the world. That's where He placed us. Like it or not. And He placed us there in suffering. And the, and the most popular preaching today is, is you know, it infers at least that, you know, well, a, prop, a, proper, a properly led Christian life, there's no suffering. If you do everything right, you won't suffer. I think the more you, I think it's just the opposite myself. That's just, you know, the more you do things right, the more you suffer. But that's just me. And what's interesting about this is, you know, as we begin this chapter, I, you know, and I, folks, I can't tell you how important it is that we all recognize the suffering in this passage of Scripture because seven times we see it mentioned. Verse 3, we suffer in order to experience the comfort of God. Verse 4, we suffer in order that we may be able to comfort others. Verse 5, we suffer in order to fill up that which is lacking in the afflictions of Christ in, in our flesh for His body's sake, which is the church. You know, we find that as a result of that, our comfort abounds in Christ. In verse 6, we suffer, we're, we're afflicted for your consolation and suffering. You know, we suffer for others. Verse 7, we suffer because it makes our hope more precious. You know, suffering actually, actually accentuates our hope of glory. The suffering in verse 9 teaches us not to trust ourselves, but to trust in God. And in verse 12, suffering leads to rejoicing. You know, you, you could say, you know, you could say, you know, oh, I'm so happy I've never had to suffer. But you, folks, you really wouldn't know what joy was. You wouldn't know what rejoicing was unless you'd gone through the suffering. So suffering is not only, it doesn't, it doesn't just heighten our hope of glory, it heightens our trust in Christ. It, it heightens our rejoicing. Now that's seven valid reasons for the believer suffering. All of which, get this, please, don't miss this. They have nothing to do with sin. Dearly beloved, we fellowship with one another in prayer and in suffering and in rejoicing, and not one bit of it is in the sphere of human merit. Not one bit. And verse 13 begins a subject that seems to bother a whole lot of people as they study this passage. You know, we're not going to write anything unto you other than that which you acknowledge or perceive would be the Word of God. And and the word is gnosko, it's experiential knowledge. What you read or acknowledge, I trust that you'll acknowledge as, as you also have acknowledged. So the church at Corinth has acknowledged this. And this is all pointed toward their perception. We are not writing anything that you haven't perceived, and I trust that you shall perceive it even to the end. You've also had an experiential knowledge of this. Those of you who are true believers in Christ to some degree or another, you, you've had experiential knowledge of this. And the trust here is that you will have that same perception all the way to the end. Beyond 2023, if we're still here. For the rest of your life here, however long God deems that necessary. Why? Why? So we'll make it to glory? No, no. No, we're going to do that. Folks, listen to me. Why would we boast in the flesh here when we're not going to boast in the flesh up there or when Christ returns? What? I, shouldn't, should, our, should not our activity, our conduct, our behavior be commensurate with that which reflects glory, not something earthly, which we are, that's where we're at now, but...
You know, there's not. I haven't found any place in the whole entire Word of God where that indicates that because you're a new creation in Christ, you have you have uh, this unbroken, uninterrupted fellowship. And in fact, this you know, and you know, and and I've you know, I keep running into these every now and then these hard line, no responsibility Christians. Well, we don't have any responsibility at all. It's just God's done it all. We don't have to do anything. You know, come on. That's the most ridiculous. That's like saying I'm married. I, 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 you know, me and my wife, we got married, and she loves me, so it doesn't matter what I do. No, Scripture is replete with exhortation. We be constantly on our guard, folks. Constantly on our guard. That, that these interruptions, that they don't overtake us unaware, without our knowing it. You know, that, that we recognize... Whatever... Whatever it is, whatever hap happens to be, what you know, anything that would take and separate us from the the communion and the fellowship and the that we have with the Lord and the peace and the joy that we carry along with us through this next new this brand new year, we write nothing. It's a, you can't understand. Nothing hard to understand. We hope and trust you'll perceive this even to the end as you also have perceived us in part that we are your rejoicing even as you are ours in the day of the Lord. What a tremendous verse. Folks, what are you going to rejoice at? What are you rejoicing in now? You know, I, I believe that the day of the Lord there, it's a particular phrase in Scripture. It, 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 it doesn't, we're not in the day of the Lord now. The, the tribulation period is an, it's an extern, extended period of time that begins with the, day, with the tribulation period. But that's just a portion of it. It goes into the kingdom age. That's a portion of the day of the Lord. So I believe the aspect of the day of the Lord that's in view here is our accounting. Not judgment. You know, our accounting before God. We will stand and give an account. Now, if there was no responsibility, no obligation, God did it all, I don't have to do anything but sit back and eat Doritos, well, then why would there even be a judgment seat of Christ? But there's no condemnation. There's therefore now no condemnation for those of you who are in Christ Jesus. We don't stand in any judicial judgment. We will stand in an accounting Relationship as members of the family of God, uh, but uh, you know, it seemed to me that one major aspect of that day of accounting is that is that if we have any any area in which to rejoice or boast, that it's in other believers. I, I totally get that unto Him be all the glory forever and ever. You know, everything. We cast our crowns at His feet. I, I get that. I understand that. But folks, we're a family. We're members of His household. You perceived it in part, he says. You know, apparently the Holy Spirit is indicating that the believers at Corinth don't understand this as deeply as Paul does. But, but they have perceived in part that their rejoicing, even as Paul's rejoicing, will be centered in one another, each other. It, so it just seems to me the Holy Spirit's saying that the heightened aspect of the day of accounting is going to be the body of Christ. And I wonder how, how, many, how, how much you know, sometimes we think of other members of the body of Christ. In fact, I, I think that's where the chapter is taking us. You know, what is their regard for another member of the body of Christ? 
seems to me that the highlighted subject of the 14th verse is to direct, you know, remember our 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 hope, our our suffering has been directed to the day of the Lord, to the hope of glory. The the great concern in that day, folks, is is not near so much it's not going to be so much on what you did or what not you should have done but it's going to be on the integrity of the body of christ it's it's in the body it's the growth of the body that we're looking at here the well-being of the body uh I want you to perceive that our rejoicing is you and you are us. Yours, your, yours is us in the day of Christ. That's when he returns. That's going to be our rejoicing. You know, the, the fact that I might have preached the gospel to 100,000 souls of which only three belong to Christ, that's, that's in, incidental. The concentration is on the three, the body of Christ. And I believe it's a, it's a proper concern. I believe it's a concern that's greatly overlooked in this present day and age that we're living. You know, well, we got this guy saved, and now if we could just get the next guy saved and, and then move on to the next one and... And the Lord Jesus Christ said three times, folks, if you love me, feed my sheep. Feed my lambs. Feed my sheep. And, and I see the same concern here for the integrity, the growth, and the well-being of the body of Christ. Thank you for joining us. Have a blessed, blessed new year. Join us on Wednesday as we're looking at parables. I love you all. I truly do. Until then. This is Steve. Thanks for watching.